thank you for coming. Um, I want to welcome you to the HEAL program's second art show of this academic year, a show that fulfills our mission to align the work of patient artists with the core medical school curriculum and foster enhanced understanding between patients and future health professionals. Our year one students are studying um, breast cancer currently, and today's artist, Corinne Lightweaver, has generously shared her beautiful artwork with our community, and today will discuss with us her own experience with breast cancer and its relationship to her artistic production. Ted Meyer, our artist in residence, is going to be talking with Corinne, and we're really hoping that Dr. Irene Kang, who's an oncologist here at Keck, will offer her insights as well. We fear she may be stuck in clinic, but um, she specializes in the treatment and support of patients with breast cancer, so we hope that she'll join us shortly. But in the meantime, please welcome Corinne and Ted. I'm going to start with just uh, a couple facts, because not being a doctor, I had to look up things today. So women one in eight in the United States is going to get breast cancer. One in a thousand men get some sort of breast cancer. What I was most interested in was the survival rate. So as I was prepping questions today, because when, when people hear about cancer, get told they're going to have cancer, it, that word, I think more than anything, has sort of this stink of death on it, that you hear you've got cancer and everybody really panics, whereas, you know, what I read, granted, off the internet, 90, there's, five-year survival rate is 90%, so it's a pretty good five-year rate, but when you were first told, you heard the word, what went through your head when the doctor came to you and said, cancer? Cancer. I have to go back just a little bit to four years earlier when I had uh, found a lump under my arm and gone to the doctor and the surgeon said, 99%, it's nothing, but we'll check. And um, it turned out to be lymphoma, not breast cancer. And I was expecting breast cancer because it does run in my father's family. Um, the person that told me that it was lymphoma uh, was a very young doctor, and uh, it was a Friday afternoon, and he got on the phone with me and said, I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> and that's what I had to live with for the, for the rest of the weekend. Um, by Tuesday, I, I uh, spoke with a doctor who um, had a background in follicular lymphoma, which I had, and said, you're gonna die of something else. You got at least 15, 20 years. So I'm on year 14 right now. Um, so four years after that diagnosis, um, I was diagnosed with cancer through a regular uh, mammogram. And in that case, uh, they said you have three, three weeks to make a decision, um, or you have three weeks to have the surgery. And uh, I could not go under, undergo radiation because uh, the doctor described my tissues as being like beef jerky from the radiation that I had from the lymphoma. Uh, given my, my father's family's experiences with breast cancer, I decided to go for a bilateral mastectomy. And um, it was very scary. Uh, I had a one-year-old child um, when I was diagnosed with lymphoma. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer a few days before she started kindergarten. And um, there's never a good lot time to leave your child. Um, but I felt she was particularly vulnerable at that time and I was afraid for her. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. So we were discussing sort of just the power of the word cancer that's for so many people it means death. As a doctor, when you have to approach people and say this is your prognosis, how? For all these guys that are going to be giving people this news, how do you how do you approach um, giving that news? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Irene King. I'm one of the breast oncologists here at Norris Cancer Center. Um, so that's a great question. Uh, that's something that each and every one of you is most likely going to have to do at some point in your training and career. Um, I think it's a huge burden, um, and it's a mix of 
I think, privilege and duty that we have uh, when we take on the medical care provider role. I think it's an area where, right, it's just such a loaded word. It carries um, so much potential pain and loss behind it. And so I think the key for me is just to tread lightly and know who is in front of me, who I'm going to be telling this news to. Um, you know, I, I know, first of all, my job is to be honest and truthful, um, but also to be certainly sensitive. And it's kind of your one chance to um, set the tone, I think, in a right way for someone. I mean, it's, it's the start of, for many people, it's the start of um, a fight and a battle and a journey. And to let them know that they're not in it alone um, and to let them know there's hope. And when I say that, I don't mean a false hope, but I mean a hope in finding still meaning in the time that you have. For some people, there's hope for a cure. Um, for other people, it's just um, hope for a better quality of life, for some relief from their cancer symptoms, um, for meaningful time with their family and loved ones. Um, so it means a lot of things, but I think it's a, a very special interaction that you have with a patient. So you, you had just adopted your child, and then you get this bad news. So, I mean, one second you like, just have my family, and then you've got this, this news. How did you, how were you able to balance those? Thoughts, how were you able to keep focusing on the excitement of having your new child? Wow. Well, I was uh, the um, home caretaker for our daughter, and um, I didn't feel sick. I didn't feel sick until I started getting the radiation. And I would leave at, at 5.30 in the morning to get there at 6 for the treatment and be back by the time that she woke up. So I felt like I was um, sheltering her from it. Um, but as time went on, I realized I was watching her from the couch sometimes instead of being down on the floor with her. And um, we ended up placing her in um, child care earlier than we would have, just a couple days a week, but to give me a break. Um, and I certainly felt very intensely that wish to protect her. So um, before we start talking about your art, do you find, because family is so important and caregiving and a lot of times it lands up involving the whole family, do you find, especially in LA where there's a lot of different cultures, is there a difference in talking to one sort of group about cancer? There's a lot of extended families and a lot of people are by themselves and do you have to adjust how you talk about the disease with different families. Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, it's knowing who's in front of you. And um, so you have to spend, for me, I feel like you have to spend a little bit of time getting to know their story, getting to know their history, um, and where they're coming from. Do they have a strong support system? Um, do they have just a newborn baby at home that they feel um, they have to you know, spend all their energy and time for? Um, do they come from a cultural background where they need to hide their sickness um, or not tell their loved ones about um, that they are sick? So we have patients uh, that come from ethnic minorities where the culture is, you know, if grandma has cancer, we can't let her know and we just kind of help her guide her through treatment and she just won't know so that she feels, she doesn't lose hope or she feels dignified. Um, and uh, right, when you have just a young, for me it's a young woman, um, maybe in her 30s, just had a baby, diagnosed with cancer. Um, it's, it's such a landfall and um, something she never imagined would happen to someone at her age, at her stage of life. Um, so when talking to patients and their families, I really try to help them, everyone be on the same page 
Um, it's obviously patient focused and so when family feels that grandma shouldn't know, um, just trying to unpack sort of the why and getting a sense for what does grandma really want and expect and how can she best spend her time? Is it really, is she gonna feel at ease being in the dark or not? And I'm, I don't wanna kind of put my cultural preconceived American notions on another family, um, but oftentimes there's a middle ground and oftentimes um, people get to different places from their initial reaction. Um, and so I feel like it's important to kind of work alongside them. Um, and when you've seen people go through this journey multiple times, you know that certain decisions tend to result in better ways. So a family sitting down and talking about it, bringing in family members to the um, doctor's office visits, to me, I think, helps everyone along that um, journey kind of know where we are so there aren't these sort of crushing surprises or um, you know, unmet expectations that happen. Okay, so this question sort of for both of you, we're gonna start with you. So this is Corrine's artwork around here. And some of the images, like there's one back there with knives in it, are very striking and jarring and almost attack you visually, where some of them are fruit and calming, and there's a monkey here, and we all love a monkey. And this one's very dreamscape, Chagallis. So I want you to talk about sort of difference in imagery and maybe what was going on in your treatment. Was it coming, going? And then while she's doing that, maybe you, could, you had talked about people who really use their time well at the end, and maybe you can think of one or two of your patients that use that limited time and came to peace with what was going on with them because they, they planned it and did something worthwhile with it. You first. First piece I did in this collection is uh, the reclining nude uh, with the yellow background there. And um, I had been in an art therapy group that was amazing. And um, I wish for you that your patients will have the option to do something like that. I was in it for three years. And this was the first piece that maybe could communicate something outside of the others, just sort of general exercises I was doing. And uh, as with a lot of the work that I do, I don't know what it's gonna say or what it's about until after I finished and uh, step back from it. Um, at that point, I had um, saline balloons under my skin, stretching the skin for uh, reconstruction. And uh, they were hard, they hurt. I would get um, phantom itching and phantom pain. And that was the first time I realized that I'd had an amputation. Um, and so that piece is called Reclining Nude with Margarine Tub Breasts. And it has, actually has styrofoam cups in there with the slash, the pink slashes where the scars are, and that's how it felt. It did felt something was inside my body, but outside. Um, several months later is the one with the knives where it was just driving me nuts, and I was having fantasies of cutting them out. Um, in big part because uh, my family was embroiled in a um, insurance issue with getting coverage, and it got so painful that I just wanted to get past it. And what about some of the calmer? The you know, calmer ones. The fruit, the... I think it's not, it's not all tragedy. What I was going through is not all tragedy. There's just everyday life going on, maybe from a different perspective than I had been expecting before this happened. Um, so with these, the fruit, um, there's a lot of round imagery and breast imagery. The clocks, when I have clocks, they're always like five to, it's five to midnight, which means I am sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop, even if it looks good. And um, part of that is just fear that a lot of people have about reoccurrence. Um, also, I, after I had my breasts removed, I uh, tested uh, positive for BRCA2. And um, so I had the, uh, 
uh, the blood test for that, and I was waiting and waiting for the results. And this, the blue one with the bra hanging over it, that was the flowers or ovaries going into the uterus, and uh, the art therapist had directed us to do a still life. And that's exactly where I felt I was at. I was in this limbo, this still life, trying to figure out, you know, if I, I do it, make further complications to health by taking out my ovaries, um, would it be a good thing? Then I don't have to worry about a third cancer coming back. Um, is that answering your question? Any patients that stick out in your mind that really use their time? I think every patient that I've met has um, been in some way, I don't know if it's forced or just rises to the occasion to um, kind of use their time wisely or well. Uh, there's something about being confronted with this diagnosis, being confronted with your own mortality or making these really hard decisions of, you know, do I take the next step? You know, is it worth the toxicity of chemo to reduce my risk of a recurrence? Um, or, right, in the case of stage four disease, wow, how much time do I have left? Um, or how can I fight this? And so um, each patient kind of I've, I've seen have to use their time well in different ways, whether it's kind of learning to uh, overcome an anxiety, learning to kind of get on with their life despite this fear of recurrence that kind of looms over the rest of your life. Um, and, you know, certainly in many, many cases, just family pouring out and friends pouring out of the woodworks and coming to just spend time and show love to this person going through um, really an extraordinary and very difficult uh, journey. Um, but I've just even in the little things I've seen, um, there's this wonderful woman who's come up with a, uh, um, I guess it's a, a patient outreach and support program called Shit That I Knit. And so she <laughs> hands out these sort of knitting kits for patients with breast cancer because um, oftentimes you're waiting for long stretches of time. You're sitting in the chemo chair for four hours every couple weeks. And so during that time, there's a lot of time for just thoughts to run through your mind or just be bored out of your mind. And so these ladies kind of knit like caps for themselves or their friends. And um, I've seen it just do really great things. I, people just come out and develop this generosity, like cancer patients themselves, patients who are touched by these patients. And um, that's what I think is really beautiful about the process. And um, it's kind of great to see people be able to use their time like that. One of my friends that went through breast cancer talked about it being, she had to go to cancer college because there's so many types of cancer. She had to learn so much about the treatment and check with different doctors to, you know, I don't even know all the different things because I have not had it. So how do, you, how do you make sure people are informed but don't scare the hell out of themselves on the internet, like looking for things? and did you scare yourself on the internet? I, I definitely did not go looking on the internet. My wife did. I got very scared. Um, but I was fortunate. It was caught early, and I felt like I didn't need to read about all the other cases. And just as a side on that, um, breast cancer patients and other cancer patients really benefit from um, meeting other people with the same conditions. And it's very helpful. On the other hand, um, most of the people that were in these classes with me are now gone. And when I look at, back at pictures from it, it's just really startling. I think overall, I'm a fan of knowledge is power. I'm very grateful that there is the internet and a lot of great reputable sites with good information for patients. Um, because you can't sit in a 30-minute visit, new patient visit, or a 15-minute follow-up visit and really get all your questions answered at the granularity that some people want it at. Um, some, for some people, kind of knowing 
the nuts and bolts really helps them feel at ease and in a place where they have maybe it's kind of some level of control or just being in their best situation possible. Um, and for some people, it's just better to go through the process and have the team that you have on board take you through it. Um, and I find that overall, I think those patients are the most sort of easygoing and tend to have a less uh, anxious experience. Um, but if someone needs to ask their 10 questions, and if someone needs to go to Google or WebMD and look those things up, I think we're in a place where we have a lot of good and correct information. But then kind of asking your doctor, you know, what out of this information pertains to me? Um, and, you know, what kind of message should I take away from, oh, stage one, two, three does like this in five years? So you're going through treatment, and what kind of artwork were you doing before, and how did you land up deciding that this was going to be your imagery for a while? Um, I was painting wildlife pictures before this, oil and acrylic, um, and pretty peaceful, intriguing, expressionist, lots of color. And um, this, I actually went to a uh, writing support group. That's a pretty typical thing. Um, and I didn't get anything out of it because I'm actually a writer and editor and couldn't get past that. So being in this therapy group, I got to access things from a completely different way. I wasn't starting out making images that made sense. She'd have us take a two color pens and scribble and then she wouldn't tell us what's happening and then now, now make a picture out of that. Or paint two pieces of paper and then make a collage out of that. So that's how I was able to access it. You changed medium, you were painting yeah. before. Yeah, then, then I did collage and assemblage. Um, Does that have anything to do with you being Yes, cut off yes, yes. Yeah, so um, feeling like I had to, to paste my body back together, paste my, my whole being back together, things were being cut and rearranged, I definitely felt like this was the right medium for me. All right, so before, we're going to open it up for you guys can ask questions, but one last question to both of you. Got a lot of students here. What, what should they know other than sort of the general you've given them before in, in dealing with this? Because they're going to get, not only have to give this news, but they're going to be attached to some patients. They're going to watch a lot of people die, and they're going to have to keep a distance. Do you have any advice for them? And then you get to give advice for them as someone who got the news. I think um, I see my personal role as an oncologist as um, really helping people live well. And for some people, that results in a lifetime cure and for some people, that's, you know, six months here on this earth. Um, and yes, it's hard and sad to say goodbye to these patients and hard to see their family members really um, go through just such a loss. Um, but it's also, kind of death is something we're all here for, you know, a relatively short amount of time. and. Um, there's something kind of profound in walking that journey with someone. Um, and I just see it as a privilege when you kind of help people with the hard stuff as well as get them to you know, the happy days where they're done with their treatment and they're going to go on surveillance. Um, and so I just encourage everybody here to look at how they can help someone. And sometimes that how they can help someone is not necessarily cure, but it's helping someone feel better, helping someone feel listened to. Um, and even patients who are getting to cure, they need that listening to and feeling better because it's not easy getting there um, at the end anyways. Uh, so that's kind of all I have. <laughs> 
I had a couple things I wanted to add. Um, one thing uh, is for lesbian and bisexual women, women they tend to have, uh, they tend to be diagnosed much later with cervical cancer, with breast cancer, because they don't feel comfortable talking to their clinicians. Um, and sometimes, and I've had this experience too, where the, the uh, doctor says, are you sexually active? Yes. What kind of birth control are you using? None. And then we go in, around in circles because the doctor doesn't get why. <laughs> um, so being aware of that, that's kind of one of the entry level steps to being uh, comfortable, your, your patients being comfortable with you is, um, you know, anticipating that the answers that you think are coming might not be coming and, and asking yourself why. Um, Another thing that happened to me with two doctors is they thought this was a great idea to suggest to me that I could go up and breast size, um, which I really didn't appreciate. Um, I think that's something for a patient to bring up themselves. Um, I just wanted to look like myself, and I was not given choices for that, uh, enough choices. Um, I was told I could get medical tattoos for my nipples. So I'm on the table when the person's about to start tattooing me, and she says, well, you know, this only lasts about six months, and you shouldn't go in the ocean, and you shouldn't go in the hot tub, and um, every time we re-tattoo it, the, the reconstruction that your plastic surgeon did uh, to make a nipple is just gonna flatten out every time. So there, there are so many things beyond just giving someone a diagnosis. Um, it is overwhelming to get so much information. There's no way you can go through it all at once. But if you can direct your patients toward resources where they can learn things, if there's an art therapy group going on. Um, there's also uh, my daughter was six when she started at a camp. It's a one-week camp for um, children of cancer patients, survivors, and those that have passed on. And for a week, the kids get two counselors assigned to them. No, no, the other way around. Two kids, one counselor. And it's fun, 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 fun all week. And they go back every year, and they're able to have a place where they know other kids are going through the same things that they're doing. And the best thing is it doesn't cost anything. OK, so I'm going to throw in my one little piece of advice to someone who's been around doctors forever. Listen to these stories as you guys are picking your specialty. Because some people, cancer might really intrigue you, but if you're not someone who can deal with people going through the story she's told, this might not be the right thing for you. You know, some people are, if, if you don't want to get close to people, maybe you'd be a great person in the emergency room where if people come in and they immediately go to sleep and you don't have to talk to them. So uh, it's sort of funny, I mean, but I've, I've been around doctors my whole life, and some of them had great bedside manner, and some didn't, and some were really good at the craft, but they were better at bedside manner. So make sure that you, you know, do you want to deal with an MS patient, and maybe you're going to be friends with them for 30 years while they deal with their MS, or, or do you not want to talk to someone and then work in the emergency room? So, I mean, that's sort of extreme, but it's, it's not just the skill and the knowledge. It's making sure you have the right disposition. So if anybody has any questions for the doctor or the artist about medicine or art and medicine, uh, feel free to come up here to the microphone. This question is for Corrine. Um, I'm just curious, because you seem so strong. Like I'm watching you and just share with us, which I think we all appreciate. And but you're, you're just, I feel like if I would have been up there, I would have just been in complete tears. And, I am curious of where you find your strength. And also, um, for those people who were there for you, how were they there for you? And what helped you, uh, you know, or what continues to help you? If I may ask you, uh, what, would you what would you be in tears about? I think just, um, I think by, by nature, I'm an emotional person. And so a lot of times, like, you know, I too have a, I have a 19 month old at home. And so uh -huh. thinking of the, what ifs or you know what could be and it's yeah. always that like question of the future yeah yeah i think that 
I have enough distance from these that I'm not reliving it with the same emotion when I'm talking to you about it. Um, and I also see, see them as a way to convey information to you that, that could help your patients. Um, so I'm kind of in a different space, but I did spend a lot of time crying in the past. <laughs> It's been um, 13, 14 years since lymphoma, 10 years since breast cancer. We were discussing before, so she has the BRCA gene, but she's not Jewish. And I have a disease that's mostly Jewish people, but a lot of non-Jews get it because you have to go back in history. A lot of Jews were forced to convert. So the fact that she has this gene but was not raised Jewish, so you can't always Think of how people present when they come in. She genetically. My dad's family's Jewish. Yeah. My, my dad's family's Jewish, so I did get tested, um, and there was a lot of cancer in his family, including breast cancer. Um, but it turned out my mom was a carrier, and there had been no cancer in her family. Hi, Corrine. Um, so you kind of touched on this that uh, being lesbian, you felt that um, your sort of interaction with the healthcare. Um, system was sometimes not ideal. I'm interested to know, kind of from the breast cancer perspective, where did that really stand out to you? Because I feel that the diagnosis is very, um, or the disease is very feminized. There's the pink ribbon, there's all these, you know, you go girl um, kind of spin offs, and th like the makeup companies want to get in, and Avon and Pantene, or um, did you feel? that there was sort of um, a lack of awareness or inclusion for like the LGBT population? Um, I, I think there's plenty of lesbians that identified with those things that you're describing. Yeah. Um, I, I see it more in, um, in the clinical interactions. Um, my plastic surgeon kept asking about my wife. Was she happy with it? Would she, what would she want? Um, I found that really startling, but really respectful. Um, I think it's important to, um, to acknowledge people's partners and family of choice, because a lot of people have had to leave their families behind to have a good life, and so the people that might want to come into the room might not have a, a legal relationship, but they're the most important person there. Thanks. Okay, one last, one last thing. Why don't you tell them what you do, because you work in an interesting group that's sort of medical, so um, they could ask you about that later okay. if they have questions. All right. Um, so I raise funds for the TLC Foundation for Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors, and that is uh, hair pulling, skin picking, nail biting, cheek biting, where the person can't stop. There's no cure for it. The treatments are not all that good, but we uh, provide support or, or resources information to families and individuals. We train clinicians. Um, we fund research, and we have uh, support groups across the nation. Um, so that is something that maybe is not well known, but affects two to four percent of the population, and people really live in shame with it, and don't know anyone else who does it. Um, so coming up in April is our annual conference, which is amazing. 500 people, clinicians, researchers, families, uh, people that haven't ever met someone, and there's no divisions between those groups. People have never met anyone with a uh, BFRB, um, or people where they've been coming for years and they get to see their friends once a year, and people will eventually leave their makeup off, take their hats off, and feel free there. So if you have an in interest in that area, um, clinicians and researchers are are very needed. And her email is on her artist statement over there. So I think we're, we're ready for Pam's closing. 
Well, first of all, I just want to thank all of you, um, Irene, Ted, and Corrine, for a really wonderful discussion. I, I just want to share my personal take-home message from this, I think, to understand who's in front of you and to take the time to get to know the person in front of you. That's where good doctoring begins. And, um, and you've shared that with us through not only your words, but your art. And um, it's a real gift to us. So I am very grateful. Thank you. Um, if any of you want to spend a little time, do you have time to chat afterwards? OK. And um, those of you who RSVP'd to the event are going to get a uh, survey um, to fill out. It'll be pushed to you electronically. Thank you for feedback. If you didn't RSVP for the event but would like to fill out a survey, Twee, who is right there, has some on paper for you. And I welcome you to take a look around, enjoy the art, and um, please feel free to come and talk some more. Thank you so much.